Okay, um, thanks very much for the introduction there. And I'd just like to say thanks to George and all the organizers of the meeting for the invitation. And I feel as if I should begin with a bit of an apology. I feel that I'm, I'm somewhat here at this meeting under false pretenses. Um, I think to describe myself as a fraud would perhaps be a little bit too strong, but I do feel to be something of a gate crasher at the Mendel birthday party. Um, because I guess hybrids are very much a theme of these two days. I'm a little bit of a, a hybrid myself, um, a molecular biologist by training. So I worked for several years in molecular biology before, before kind of just straying into the history of science and getting interested in the history um, of biology. I'm a hybrid in another sense. Um, I'm half German and I was brought up to speak the language. And this is how I ended up being kindly invited by, by Stefan and Greg Raddick to get involved in the project of producing a new translation of Mendel. So the title of my talk is Translating Mendel, or as I like to call it, Clearing the Mist Around Mendel. And I hope that uh, the reasons for that phrase will become obvious uh, a little bit later on. So to begin, um, I came across a really good quotation about translation the other day. It was the Italian philosopher and writer Umberto Eco, who said translation is the art of failure. Um, well, as I'm always trying to teach my kids, don't be frightened of failure. Failure can be instructive. Um, it can teach us things. But I guess what this quote does raise is the question of what is it that we expect from a translation? What do we want a translation to do? And um, that's something I'm just going to try and look at in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, so I'm going to basically just skim through a brief history of Mendel in translation. I mean, Stefan has given plenty more detail on, on that already, so I can skim through that. Again, why a new translation? Stefan's gone into that. Um, I'll see if there's anything else we can say. And then what I want to look at is translating Mendel beyond the Fazuka. Because it's very easy when thinking about translating Mendel just to focus on that key paper. So, Mendel, the orthodox account. Now, we've, we've already, we've been here for a day already, so we probably don't need to go into establishing too much about what the orthodox uh, account of Mendel is. You know, basically, he discovered the gene. This can be dominant or recessive. He discovered the laws of genetics. He was ahead of his time, and his discoveries went unrecognized at the time. Well, as we know, there is plenty more to be said about all those four issues. So, Translating Mendel. Well, Stefan's already introduced us to William Bateson, um, his, his translation from 1901 done with the poet and fern specialist uh, Drury. And there's a little cartoon I found there, William Bateson, as you may never have seen him before, a uh, little cartoon there. Of course, a year after that first translation, the revised version of that translation appeared in Bateson's book, Mendel's Principles of Heredity, a defense, and that word a defense, I think is really interesting there because obviously it prompts the question, well, defense against what? And of course the bigger historical context of that time was that Bateson was involved in an intellectual punch up over the future of genetics. Uh, in the blue corner, Bateson representing the, the Mendelian school of genetics who were advocating that you look at discontinuous traits in individuals and in the red corner, Frank Raphael Weldon, um, carrying the banner for the biometricians who were looking at continuous variation in populations. I'm not going to say any more about that punch up. I draw your attention to it. Simply to raise the idea that translations, they take place not in a vacuum, but in a, in a context, a bigger sociological context. Um, and, you know, no talk should be complete without a book plug. So I'm going to plug my colleague Greg Raddick's new book that's coming out January 2023, Disputed Inheritance, The Battle Over Mendel and the Future of Biology, where he really goes into that, that fight between Bateson um, and Weldon. Look out for this book. When it comes out, buy, beg, borrow or steal a copy, because I think 
I think it's going to make a splash um, in the field of Mendel scholarship. So look out for that. So those are the Bateson translations. The other big translation came in 1966 to, to mark the centenary of Mendel. That was by the geneticist Kurt Stern and his PhD student, Ava, Ava Sherwood. Now, what's interesting about their translation is, I guess translation is always a balancing act. On the one hand, you want to consider the elegance of the translation. On the other hand, however, opposing that, you want to try and stay honest to the authentic um, sense of the original 19th century German. So it's a trade-off between the two. Bateson's translation may have been stronger on the elegance, but Stern and Sherwood were trying to get back more to the feel of the authentic German. So that's, what, three translations we've got there already. Why on earth bother with a new one? You know, if it ain't broke, why fix it? So here is the print copy of the translation by myself and Stefan. Here you go. There it is. Um, as Stefan showed you, it appeared first of all on the British Society of History of Science website. So this was in 2016. Uh, it was kindly supported by the British Society of History of Science and then published by the University of Masaryk Press. Why embark on a new translation? Well, I think it's because in the decades since Bateson and Stern and Sherwood, the, the scholarship and debate around Mendel has really moved on. And there have been some really important developments, which we've heard a lot about yesterday. Um, to be fair, I guess it was Fisher with his 1936 paper who really kicked off um, that debate. But these challenges to the orthodox account I've summarized here. I don't have time to go into the detail of them all. That would that would probably fill a day's worth of talks in itself. Um, just briefly, of course, you had Augustine Brannigan, 1979, saying, you know, Mendel wasn't really interested in inheritance. He was interested in evolution, and he was interested in evolution through the formation of hybrids. And once you see him like that, he begins to appear not so much neglected. And also Brannigan had interesting things to say about what was going on about the so-called rediscovery, showing it's maybe not quite what we think it was. Um, 1988, you had Callender coming along saying, yes, Mendel was interested in hybrid formation, but he was doing that because he was opposed to evolution. He wanted to demonstrate the fixity of species. And then same year as Augustine Brannigan, you had uh, Robert Olby with his, his now classic paper, um, with that incendiary title, Mendel was no Mendelian. Again, I don't have the time and the space to go into uh, Olby's arguments. Why on earth would anyone say Mendel was no Mendelian? Um, as a little footnote, it was actually a um, historian here at Leeds, John Hodge, who actually suggested to Olby that he insert this question mark here at the end of it. Um, in a nutshell, what Olby was saying was Olby said he wanted to set out to strip away these inflated Whiggish expectations that have grown up around Mendel. Uh, what do we mean by, by Whiggish, if you don't know? Well, basically, this is, this is when history is written by the winners. It's that, it's that writing of history where you basically project the interests and knowledge of the present day back onto the protagonists of the past, and you cut and trim them to fit the present day. Another way of thinking about it is what you're doing is you are wrenching the protagonists of the past out of their native historical context and you're setting them down in a historiographic landscape that is utterly alien to them. Albee's take on this was that Mendel wasn't really, he didn't really discover particular units of inheritance and Albee's argument rested on this. So if you open any textbook of biology, you'll see Mendel's famous formula shown here. So you've got the two capitalized A's representing the two dominant alleles. And then on, on this side of the equation, you've got the two lowercase A's representing the two recessive alleles. And here you've got the heterozygote. But as Albee pointed out, Mendel never actually wrote that. If you go back to his original paper, and here's a little scan of his original manuscript, this is what he wrote. And Olby says the difference may appear subtle, but it's important. Because Olby says what Mendel's doing in this equation is he's not making a reference to the inner constitution of those cells. When he writes uppercase A and lowercase A there, 
What he's talking about is what today, I guess, we would call the phenotype of the plant. Okay. <clears throat> now, this project of Albies to strip away the Whiggish inflated, in, uh, the Whiggish inflated Whiggish expectations of Mendel and put him back squarely in the context of 19th century biology, I guess presented a challenge for me coming to Mendel as a scientist, because as a scientist, I have been raised from infancy on that orthodox account of Mendel, the discoverer of the gene, the lone, the lone genius, the man who's way ahead of his time. So I came to Mendel wearing wig-shaped spectacles with very thick distorting lens, lenses that sat heavily on my head. It took a lot of effort to try and hoist them off. I don't know how successfully I've done that in trying to see Mendel afresh. To illustrate that point from a different way, let me introduce another translation project that I've been involved with. Um, historian Nira Jasankaran kindly involved me to get involved with translating another um, key figure from the German speaking 19th century world of science. This is Friedrich Miescher here um, on the right. If you've not heard of him, that, that doesn't surprise me. Um, he's the guy who actually discovered DNA, but it, he, he seems to have been eclipsed by the names of the people who discovered its structure. So if you walk into the uh, Eagle pub in the center of Cambridge, there is this plaque that famously uh, proclaims the fact that on this spot, February 1953, Francis Crick and James Watson came running in making the first public announcement of the discovery of DNA. That, that's what the plaque says. It's wrong on two counts. Firstly, Watson and Crick never, never burst into the pub declaring they discovered the secret of life. And secondly, they didn't discover DNA. As we all know, they discovered its, its, its structure. Misha discovered DNA back in 1869, washing pus off surgical bandages. Um, it's probably good that we've got a couple of hours to go before lunch, having put that image in your heads. But his paper, has never actually been translated into English. And Neeraj invited me to get involved with that. So last year, Neeraj and I published a, a translation, the first to our knowledge, into English of Misha's paper, along with a commentary, a bit like Stefan and I did with Mendel. Now, the reason I'm bringing Misha into this is this. Translating Misha was much easier than translating Mendel. And the reason for that is Misha's paper is largely just an exercise in empiricism. It doesn't have this great overarching theoretical superstructure on it like Mendel's does. Uh, no, no disrespect to Misha's paper, but it is basically a glorified cookbook. He's basically saying, look, I took 15 cc's of sodium sulfate, and then we took some diluted hydrochloric acid, and we washed the cells, and we added a bit of alcohol and ether and this and this. It's not to do his paper down. It's an important paper, but it's a very different beast to Mendel's. And because it's just a glorified cookbook, it's much easier to translate. And as Nira just said, there are actually always two translations going on at work. You've got what does this word mean? And then you've got a translation across time. What would this word have meant to that protagonist in the 19th century? So what were we trying to do with our new translation? Well, Stefan's gone into that. We're trying to put Mendel back in the context of the 19th century. Um, as Stefan said, we're not, we're not saying our translation is any better than the others. What we wanted to do, what we felt that nobody had yet done with their translation was, was to provide this exhaustive accompanying commentary, giving you reasons for choosing certain words and also helping set those words in the historical context so that you give readers a sense of the nuance, the nuance and the connotations around those words. So I just want to give you just a few brief examples of that. And the first one is the actual title of the paper. Now, Bateson translated this as um, Versuche über Pflanzen Heiberden. Bateson translated it as uh, experiments in plant hybrids. That little preposition über in German, little preposition, but it's got a lot of significance. It doesn't translate easy into English. It can translate as experiments on plant hybrids, but, you know, that can mean plant hybrids as the object of the experiment, as in I am doing an experiment on a plant hybrid, I'm dissecting it, it is the object of my experiment, or plant hybrids as the subject of the experiment. The closest you would probably get to in English with that is experiments about or experiments on the subject of plant hybrids. Doesn't trip quite so easily off the tongue, but it's little things like this that we wanted to draw attention to because they may seem small, but I think they are significant. So another 
another really interesting little example I'd like to offer you is we, we heard yesterday uh, quite a bit about the fact that Mendel never actually uses the, the German verb uh, in, for inheritance in his paper, for Erbung. Or to tell a lie, he uses for Erbung once, I think, and it's kind of interesting then because he's actually talking about something not being inherited. But a verb he does use is this construct, übergehen auf, which I think is a really interesting verb. And it's just struck me that I... I'm getting excited. I'm, I'm, I'm getting excited about my favorite verbs. I really probably do need to get out more. Um, Übergehen auf is an interesting construct in German because it doesn't have an object. So uh, you know, I'll, I'll spare you a great grammar lesson. But look, if you think about a sentence, I see the dog. What's the verb? It's see. What's the object of that sentence? The dog. Right. Übergehen auf doesn't have an object. It's it means inheritance, but more in the sense of an intangible, indi uh, indivisible um, thing like a right, a title, a privilege, you know, perhaps like a, a monarchical, you know, monarchical inheritance, inheriting the, crown, the throne, the right to the crown. We thought that was really quite interesting that, that's, that he uses a verb that doesn't have an object when he's talking about inheritance. Um, here's another one I liked. Dominant. So Mendel's credited with coming up with the, the term dominant. But when you actually look at the, the verb he uses, dominierende, well, that can mean dominating as well. And, and we thought maybe rather than simply referring to the a state, a dominant state, he's referring to the result of an activity. Um, now, this leads us into another example. He says that this, this dominant dominating had a doppel to bedeutung it's got a double meaning and, and Stefan said here that you know when he talks about dominant dominating he's not just referring to the parental traits but he's actually referring to the behavior in succeeding generations what do i mean by that well related to that is how he refers to his hybrids he talks about the hybrid form and but look he's that is a compound noun. So as Stefan said, it suggests Mendel's thinking about these hybrids as a category apart. And he's not just interested in the traits he can see on them. He's interested in how do they behave over successive generations. The hybrid, in Mendel's thinking, we think the hybrid is that plant which gives rise to progeny that, throw, that show that three to one segregation on their offspring. So Stefan has Stefan published a paper in 2001, uh, 2007, sorry, where I think what he did there was a really interesting bridging between the orthodox Mendel and the Mendel of the revisionists, uh, Mendel the hybridist. You know, I think as human beings, we often tend to see fights where they really needn't be one. And I think Stefan's 2007 paper was really important in, in solving that problem. Because uh, as Stefan said, Mendel started out as a hybridist, but what he did was he took the program way beyond hybridism and he actually moved from being concerned with the overall form of the plant, like the hybridists were, to focusing on, on individual traits and looking at the transmission of those traits over successive generations and asking the question, you know, do the plants give rise to the three to one segregation? If so, they are, they are the hybrids. So when, when he's writing his equation here, this uppercase A um, gives rise to the parental trait, this lowercase A gives rise to the parental trait and the, the combination um, is giving rise to that segregating pattern, and that is the hybrid. So I kind of think Mendel himself almost emerges as a historiographic hybrid out of this. Mm, just a last couple of examples. What did he mean by factors? Because that's a really important one. He uses this word factors. Well, in, in our commentary, we're pointing out that he, he actually he actually takes over um, Carl, Gar Carl Gartner's terms for factors here. He's using those. Similarly, with that tricky word element. And that brings me to what I think may be the most interesting word in the whole of the paper, uh, controversial, which is this word widerstrebend. When he's talking about those elements, he described them as die, die widerstrebende elemente, and we've translated that as opposing elements. That term widerstrebend means an active act of resistance. And what's really interesting about that, I think, is that 
whatever his understanding of these factors and elements is, it's as if he's imbuing them with some kind of vitality. It's almost as if he's picturing them as opposing forces pulling up in opposite directions. Um, I've stuck my neck out here and suggested it may be that what you're seeing here is the influence of the last vestigial influences of a, an intellectual movement in Germany, Naturphilosophie, which was around at the start of the 19th century, pretty much died out by Mendel, but it saw in nature a driving kind of formative force. And I'm just wondering whether you're still seeing traces of that here in um, Mendel. So, you know, just to sum up, Stefan has said that Translation is not just a practical exercise. Um, it actually becomes part of the research. And that's what we're trying to do here in translation. We're trying to take figures like Mendel, put them back into their native historical context. To use that, to think about that another way, you're all down there at the minute um, in the vicinity of Bristol Zoo. I kind of think about Whiggish history. It's a bit like taking historical figures and out of their native historical context and putting them in the zoo. What we're trying to do with translation is an act of historiographic rewilding. Um, and at the same time as we published our translation, Stefan's already mentioned, of course, um, Daniel Fairbanks and Scott Abbott did their own wonderful act of historiographic rewilding with looking at this paper of uh, Darwin's influence on Mendel. In the last five minutes, so that is a really important paragraph from their paper. Go and take a look at that. I'm running out of time, so I won't go into it too much. Um, take a look at their paper to look at that paragraph. Um, but yeah, translating Mendel, it's not just about Die Versuche. You can go beyond it. There was this really important paper here by, by Zhang uh, and others, which looked at some reports on Mendel's previous two lectures. And also more recently, there's been work published looking at two newspaper reports on Mendel from 1861, where they're talking about hybridization work he's doing on things like spinach uh, and fuchsias from Die Brunner Zeitung. And finally, translating Mendel isn't just about primary sources. A couple of years ago, I was asked to review this collection of essays put together to celebrate 150 years of Mendel. They were all in German. There were three papers in there that really jumped out at me. I don't want to steal the author's thunder themselves. The papers are out there online. You can chase them up. So in the last two minutes, I'm going to give you a brief summary. One of those papers was about the rediscovery. Uh, and we've heard a lot about the three discover rediscoverers. It turns out there may actually be four. And the fourth one was Erich von Chermak's brother, Armin, um, because they had a very interesting correspondence that the authors of this paper had brought to light. I had a crack at translating one excerpt from that correspondence. Chermak's brother Armin, writing 18th of February 1901, says, Der gute Mendel hat uns wirklich durch seine unklare Schweindelsdarstellung besonders um, schändlich in die Ehre geführt. Right, roughly speaking, he's saying, good old Mendel has made a right pig's ear of things, um, and because of that, he's shamefully misled us. Um, and then he thanks his brother. He says, thank goodness, basically, that you at the 11th hour have um, been able to rescue us from that. Strong stuff. So this paper brings to light this new correspondence between Armin and Erich von Chermak. Second paper. So Mendel's work neglected. Well, apparently not. Turns out there was an off print of Mendel's work in 1867 in the German town of Bamberg, which was a major center of seed production. The authors of this paper show just how far and wide the uh, Brunn Natural History Society's papers were being circulated with these green dots. They also show with these red dots where Mendel's paper was being cited. The Bamberg offprint is an intriguing one because for reasons best known to themselves, the, uh, the editor decided to ditch all Mendel's numerical work, um, which is a little bit of an oversight with hindsight. And the third paper refers to this character, Count Imre for Stetics, um, in contrast to a quiet, uh, quiet Augustinian friar. He was an ex hussar who'd fought against the Ottoman Turks. When he wasn't doing that, he was looking at sheep breeding. And in a paper of 1819, he actually came up with four laws about the inheritance of traits in sheep, which I've, uh, I've reproduced here from uh, this paper by Zabo and Potsai. So check out that paper there from 2019, um, which is all about festetics. So to summarize then, um, 
clearing the mist around Mendel. Why did I call it that? Yeah, well, I'm going to call Nobel laureate Sidney Brenner to the witness stand here. Uh, he has a wonderful quotation, I think, which really hits the nail on the head about translating Mendel. He says, for most young molecular biologists, the history of their subject is divided into two epochs, the last two years and everything else before that. The present and the very recent past are perceived in sharp detail. The rest is swathed in a legendary mist where Crick, Watson, Mendel, Darwin, perhaps even Aristotle, coexist as uneasy contemporaries. I think that is a wonderful, um, a wonderful quotation there. Uh, speaking as someone who was once one of those young molecular biologists of whom Brenner despaired, I think we can perhaps be forgiven for seeing Mendel like that. I think the reason is, for people like me, our understanding of Mendel is derived solely from science textbooks. Um, and as Thomas Kuhn, the physicist turned philosopher Thomas Kuhn, probably more famously known for the, uh, the idea of the paradigm shift, which has now gone well beyond philosophy of science into management textbooks and uh, management training seminars. Um, I think he's, he, he should be remembered really for his warning. Um, on the opening page of Structure of Scientific Revolutions, he warned us the worst place to learn the history of science is from a science textbook. Why? Well, Kuhn says it's because science textbooks are there to be pedagogical and persuasive. They're there to teach, yeah? He likened learning the history of science from a science textbook to basically thinking that you are intimately acquainted with the culture, history, and language of a foreign country, having just flicked through the pages of a glossy tourist brochure. And the result of doing that is that we end up with historical figures who are swathed in that legendary mist. They are wrenched out of their native historical environment and turned into mythologized figures, as has been done with Mendel. So we get the lone genius, you know, the man who was way ahead of his time, the priest who held the key to evolution, you know. Um, I'm not sure that these, I'm not sure this mythologizing really helps us understand any more about Mendel. I think when we call him a genius, you know, I'm not sure that that has any explanatory power. It strikes me as a bit of a cop out, you know. Um, <clears throat> just finally, why bother? Does any of it, does it really matter, these debates around who discovered the gene, as long as someone did and we can do interesting things with it? Well, Jan Sapp said Mendel's experiments are a meeting place where scientists discuss the definition of science itself. I think it really does matter. Um, um, to explain why, I call another Nobel laureate to the witness stand. Marshall Nirenberg got the 1968 Nobel Prize for helping decipher the genetic code. A year before that, he said, look, you know, when man becomes capable of instructing his own cells, he must refrain from doing so until he's got sufficient wisdom to use that knowledge for the benefit of mankind. And the decisions concerning the application of that knowledge ultimately must be made by society and only an informed society can make such decisions wisely. Now, when I was a molecular biologist and I was working with things like PCR and messenger RNA on a daily basis, I never thought I would see the day when those terms became part of everyday vocabulary and TV news bulletins. In the past two years, that's become the case thanks to um, the COVID pandemic. And I think we've all become, the general public have become very aware of the impact and importance of science on their lives. And I think, you know, part of becoming that informed society that Marshall Nirenberg said we need is part of that is having a more honest account of how science works. And yeah, translation may well be an act of failure. We may never succeed in completely capturing our subject, but that doesn't make it worthless. It's an essential part of clearing away those myths and mists around Mendel. So just to finish, I will say, for those of you who have really strong feelings about the historical interpretation of Mendel, he discovered the gene or he didn't discover the gene, he was a hybridist. Um, you might be interested to know that the German word mist has a very different meaning to the word in English, but um, it may, in a, in a turn of linguistic serendipity, the German word mist may turn out to be very, very apt for the idea of clearing away the mist around Mendel. If you don't know your German, have a quick look on Google Translate and look up that word mist and see what it means. And on that note, um, I'm just gonna thank you all once again for listening so patiently. Thanks to the organizers. Um, I want to thank the British Society for History of Science there for supporting the project and Greg Raddick, Raddick for getting us onto it and uh, Andre and Lucy um, at the Mendel Museum for the publication of Michel Durink's For All His Hard Work on the online translation. 